Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first ever Nature Hour. My name is Fritz Schroeder, and I'm the Vice President of the Lancaster Conservancy's Community Impact Department. And I'm so very excited to welcome you this evening to our very first virtual lecture, which is meant to bring an assortment of local and regional experts directly to your home. Presentations will focus on subjects near and dear to the Conservancy's heart. This is a series of lectures that will be taking place every other Wednesday evening from 6 to 7 p.m. through the end of July. At the end of this evening's presentation, we will share all of the upcoming topics. You can also find them on our website at lancasterconservancy.org under upcoming events. We encourage you to pre-register. The format of Nature Hour is a 40-minute presentation followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. If you have questions, as Kelly alluded to, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to have them answered at the end of the presentation. I'm sure there'll be a lot of burning questions. We are recording tonight's presentation and we'll send it out to everyone who registered within 24 hours. So if you have any technical difficulties or you miss a portion of the presentation, it will be available in its entirety. Tonight I'm joined by my two incredible colleagues from our community impact department, Kelly Snavely, who you've met. She's our director of marketing and communications and my co-host for these lectures and Faith DeJong, our development and annual fund coordinator. We're also very excited to have Lancaster Conservancy's president and CEO, Phil Wenger, with us this evening. And I would like to invite Phil to say a few words. I would like to add my words of welcome and excitement for you choosing to spend an hour with us this evening. Most of you are our friends, but I wanted to take a moment here to introduce a stranger to the Conservancy. We are first and foremost a land bank who really goes out and identifies those special pieces of ground that should never be developed. And over the last 50 years, we've actually acquired 6,500 acres. 6,500 acres is more than 10 square miles. And there is a nature preserve in Lancaster County within 10 miles of every single resident. And the question is, why do we do this? Well, we do this because these nature preserves are all open to the public. So you can go there and meditate, you can go there and hike, you can go there, recreate, fish, and hunt. And in these days of COVID, it's become just so essential that people have places to go to escape. And we've got our usership up this spring by three and four times what it was in previous years as people are desperate for healing in this time of so much uncertainty. But we do it for more than just the humans who wanna go interact. We are all about habitat and clean water and our nature preserves serve as habitat. So we go in and we have to manage and restore these lands so that they serve in, in, in a very, eco-balancing kind of way. And so we care for the land and that care is so critical, particularly when it comes to the waterways, like you're gonna to learn tonight about all the creatures and aquatic insects that share this wonderful world with us. But it's more than just acquiring land and caring for it. The most important thing we do is we connect you to nature. And we do that with events like tonight we do that by inviting you to come and hike. And we know that if we can get you involved and excited about our work, interacting with our wonderful nature preserves, you will end up supporting us. And then we just grow that family of supporters into an army. And over time, we can hold back the tide of development where we're losing land much faster than we're acquiring it. And we can move forward that way. So I just wanted to say one little story here at the end. I saw this presentation about two years ago. I'm sure it's improved and better than that. And I was so inspired. I raced out and I bought a camera, an underwater camera and a wetsuit. 
so that I could explore these Susquehanna Riverlands, which is our focus area here, this conservation landscape and the streams along the Susquehanna River. And putting your face down here is an immersive, incredible experience, and you do not have to go to the Caribbean to do it. So I'm looking forward, Keith, to this presentation, and I just can't wait. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Phil. The Conservancy's success isn't possible without an incredible business, uh, our incredible business sponsors who understand the importance of our natural lands and strong local environment. Tonight in particular, we wanna thank Turkey Hill Dairy, who is our presenting sponsor of Lancaster Water Week coming up August 7 through 15, and Clark Associates, who's our lead annual sponsor. A sincere thank you to Turkey Hill Dairy and Clark Associates for their support of Nature Hour. And now, please help me welcome Keith Williams from Freshwater Journeys. Keith has over 15 years of experience exploring and documenting the life of freshwater rivers and streams. His presentation will include images he's gathered through many snorkeling expeditions of the Susquehanna Riverlands, which is the region where a majority of our preserves uh, exist and are, and are held in perpetuity. And one of his quotes, streams contain some of the most fascinating life on the planet. They hold biological treasure hidden from view. And we couldn't agree more. We're absolutely thrilled to welcome Keith for our very first Nature Hour presentation. Take it away, Keith. Yeah, thank you, Fritz and Kelly and Phil and Faith. And um, I'm grateful to everybody joining us tonight. I'm especially grateful to the Conservancy for protecting places that look like that. Because as Phil said, I depend on places that look like that. I need to be in that beauty. I need to be in that nature for my physical health, my emotional health, my spiritual health. Um, and I think, you know, places like this certainly draw us to them. Uh, and this is one of the, the many rivers uh, that, that uh, transect the Riverlands region. As Phil said, it's this amazing conservation landscape of these rolling hills in the lower Susquehanna River Valley with these streams that make their way through the hills and in some cases cut through the underlying geology to create these amazing gorges. And as beautiful as, the pla as these places are from the surface, what a lot of people miss is the incredible beauty and diversity and abundance and just intricate lifestyles of the life that's, that's hidden from view, that's, that's hidden by that reflective plane of those, those amazing creeks. Uh, and that becomes critically important when we consider the next slide, that this green curve on this graph shows an exponential growth in annual extinctions globally in the last 50 years. And freshwater ecosystems are at the epicenter of that that we're losing species faster from freshwater systems than we're losing species from any other ecosystem on the planet. And while the, the root cause of those extinctions varies, obviously, from geography to geography and socioeconomics and all those other factors that impact extinction, what I found over the last 15 years of snorkeling rivers all over the world is that a common thread is people don't know what we're, what we're losing. People don't know what's in our rivers and streams. And so when folks look at a, a river that looks like this from the surface, and even a river that looks like that from the surface, what most people think uh, is below the surface looks like this. Really nothing of value or worth or beauty, when in fact, our rivers look like that underwater. Uh, and it's just this incredible beauty that, that draws me to the river every day, uh, every day that I can get there. And it's just more than beauty though, right? So I spent my life studying this life. My undergraduate and graduate degrees really focused on freshwater ecology. And you know, every time I we went to the river, we took the life out of the river and brought it up into our element. We took life out of their element and brought it into the air. Uh, and it wasn't until I started snorkeling rivers about 15 years ago that I realized that we were really missing the boat. And here's an example of that. So I run snorkeling trips all over the country and I've got a group of, of students from Boston in this river. It's the White River. Uh, it's part of the Green Mountain National uh, uh, Forest in Vermont. And I'm so excited to get kids from Boston outside into Vermont for starters. And we had this trout that was really cooperative with us that day. And so we're in this river and we're watching this trout. And after a couple of minutes, this girl picks her head out of the water and says, he's beautiful, I love him. And she puts her face back down in the water and we're snorkeling around watching this fish and watching the nuances of this fish, right? We're watching how it's got executive function going on, right? You can see that eye watch us and watch the current and go and nab food and, and just navigate these really complex currents. And a couple minutes later, this girl picks her head out of the water and says, how can we conserve something if we don't even know it's there? Now, at first, that struck me as a pretty silly statement because we know that fish is there. We probably put it there from a hatchery. But when we think a little bit more deeply about it, she's got a really valid point. And that is that we don't know what that trout is like on its own terms in its own home. We study those trout. I know that trout on the end of my fishing line. 
I know that trout on a stringer. I know that trout in a net. I know that trout on a plate. But it wasn't until I started watching these fish, like bird watching, uh, where I started to realize that they weren't objects to catch or to count, but they're really subjects. And there's a pretty significant distinction between object and subject. I mean, these, these organisms that live in our rivers and streams are just incredibly beautiful and complicated and complex. And we certainly have that here. I mean, these streams are just absolutely beautiful. And I'm so incredibly grateful to the Conservancy for preserving places that look like this from the surface. And as Phil said, I mean, these preserves are really important to folks. And, and if, if the COVID pandemic has taught us anything, it's how, how much we depend on these green spaces for our, our, our own well-being. Being, this is, is Climbers Run. And as I snorkeled there this spring, you know, it was really loaded with people, which is a good thing and a bad thing, both. We have to make, make sure that we're not overusing these places and loving them to death. But the reaction that I got from folks when they saw me float in the river was sometimes fright, which I hated to do. They thought I was a, a body floating there. Um, but it was really shock and surprise that when I told them I was looking at sites like this, right? So these, these streams just contain this incredible diversity and beauty and, and really complexity in life history. Um, as exemplified by these fish. And so these two fish in the foreground, uh, this one on top is, is a male chub, the one with the spikes on his face. And the one beneath him is a female. And this, this is right about their spawning season right now. And, and this time of year, the males get these, these horns. They sprout these horns on their face that they, they have some version of that throughout the year, but not nearly as dramatic as it is now. Those are called tubercles. And we're not 100% sure what, what uh, uh, function tubercles serve. We're fairly certain it's related to reproduction. Uh, it might be sparring with other males. And I've seen male chubs bat each other out of the way, headbutt each other, fighting over prime, uh, prime breeding real estate. Um, but it also might be a female attractant. But either way, they sprout these really dramatic horns and they, get to, they, 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 they color up and look like uh, swimming sunsets, just so beautiful on their, on their pectoral fins, their anal fins, their opercular, their gill covers, their undersides. Um, and our riverland streams are loaded with them. So I've never seen, an, every one of these fish in this video is a chub. And that's from a riverland, riverland stream that's protected by the conservancy. I've never seen an accumulation of chubs this thick. And they provide habitat for a whole bunch of other fish. And so you'll see this video, here comes a chub right there and he just deposited a pebble. So this big mound of, of gravel is his breeding home. It's his, his chub mound that he spawns on. Here he comes with another one and he dropped it down. They require clean gravel to spawn on. So what those male chubs do is they make kind of like a, uh, a rock and egg lasagna. So they'll start out with a layer of pebbles that they select, and then they'll spawn with a female. And those fertilized eggs will fall down into the interstitials of the, the pebbles. Then they'll put another layer of rock on top of that to protect the layer of fertilized eggs, and they keep on going. What also happens though is these other species of fish also depend on clean gravel for spawning. And so these are common shiners, also known as bait. When you go to a bait shop and you get shiners, this is what you're getting most of the time. Right about now, this time of year, these are male shiners that, again, put on this amazing color display. This is in a riverland stream. These are not exotics, right? This is, as Phil alluded to, this is not the Caribbean that you have to go to to see these kinds of colors. It's really incredible. And so these are male common shiners that are batting each other out of, out of the way uh, to, for the right to spawn on that chub mound. And here's a chub that really displays uh, the dramatic nature of those, those tubercles, and he's sizing up that rock. And I've seen these fish carry rocks that are bigger than their bodies, and they kind of drag them along the bottom to deposit. And this is one in Tennessee, in the Hiawassee River in Tennessee. Right there in the middle, you'll see that rock in that, in that chub's mouth. And I watched this particular fish build a nest in the course of um, over two days. Uh, it started with flat river bottom, and after about two days' time, it was a four-foot diameter and two-foot tall mound of fairly large-sized gravel. And all these other fish are dependent on that chub mound for spawning. And so these red ones are Tennessee shiners. You'll see some, some more paint shiners showing up here in a little bit that have, uh, you know, the red, red face paint and just incredible um, spawning feet to watch. There he comes in right there to deposit another rock. And you know, these fish, common shiners, all depend on that clean gravel that the, uh, the chub provides them. And they're not the only colorful fish in rivers and streams. In fact, one of the most common fish that we have in riverland streams are these beauties. These are called rosy sided dace. And these are spectacular throughout the year. You, I could snorkel in the middle of winter and find these, these fish with that kind of crimson red, crimson red 
on their sides. This time of year, they get really, really brilliant. Like these fish in another Riverland stream. Just, I love watching these fish any time of year. And this time of year, the males get um, almost turquoise blue. Their, their entire body gets covered in tubercles. And so they have this like turquoise halo that cover all of them. And you'll see some of these other fish, this one right up in the, up in the left corner here, and that one, these are another kind of fish called the black-nosed ace. Another really common fish in our riverland streams. In fact, um, they're common in urban streams too. And right about now, the males get these really brilliant orange pectoral fins, you know, the ones up front, and they get orange sides. So these are two males that are trying to court a female. There's a female in the middle right there. Uh, and I've seen these in, in the Conestoga River in downtown Lancaster. I've seen these in rivers that traverse through the middle of Baltimore City. Uh, interestingly, the ones that live in, in developed uh, watersheds, like the Conestoga that goes through Lancaster or some of the streams that go through Baltimore, have developed the ability to sprint. Uh, and it, it makes sense when you think about the hydrology of an urban river, right? So you, you, when you pave a watershed, uh, when rain hits that pavement, that impervious surface, the rooftops, the sidewalks, the driveways, the roads, it runs off really hard and really fast to the local stream, which means that flash floods, that, that current comes up really fast, the water level comes up really fast. So whoever's living there needs to be adapted to be able to, to deal with that rapidly changing current. And so black-nosed dace that live in urban watersheds amazingly are spectacular sprinters. They also don't live nearly as long as, as uh, black-nosed dace that live in non-urbanized watersheds, and they don't get to the same size. But I thought that was a pretty fascinating adaptation for a really common but absolutely stunningly beautiful fish. And then some of the beauty that we have in our rivers isn't there anymore. Uh, these are river herring, and they should be in river land streams. They're migratory. They spend their lives at sea. They come into freshwater to spawn. Um, unlike salmon that spawn once in their life, these are multiple spawners, and so they can come and go a couple of times in their adult lives, which they live to be about six or seven years old. Um, but we've got dams that are in the way of these fish coming from the uh, Atlantic Ocean up through the Chesapeake Bay into the Susquehanna River and then into the Riverland streams. And so they should be there. They're missing. But they're still in streams just to the south of the Riverlands region. And I get to snorkel with these fish every April. And it's absolutely amazing for a couple of reasons. And one of those is that these fish have suffered a 90% decline in their numbers in the mid-Atlantic population uh, in the last 25 years. So a 90% decline of mid-Atlantic river, river herring uh, has, has uh, occurred in the last 25 years for a couple of reasons. One is dams. The other one is overfishing. And so there's been a fishing moratorium imposed to try to get their numbers up. And so, you know, I do a lot of work with, with outdoor education and, and trying to connect people with nature and especially kids. And what we found is sometimes the message is kind of negative, right? So what do you hear in that seashell? Or I, I hear sea level rising. I hear bluefin tuna being hunted. I hear boat people crying. I want my iPod back. And there's a growing body of evidence. In fact, there's a whole book about being distracted. Uh, that, that the psychology behind that indicates that because the messaging is typically chronically negative, we pay attention to things that really don't matter a whole lot, like what the Kardashians are wearing or what the royal family is doing. Um, so these are kind of an interesting uh, dichotomy that there's real concern over their decline. If, if I were to sit here and tell you about that, you know, 90% decline in the last 20 years, those numbers are frightening. But if I put a mask on your face and, and a snorkel and I put you in that river with literally thousands of these herrings spawning, so you can experience the chaos and the energy of that next generation being produced, all of a sudden that 90% decline becomes very, very real, very tangible, and very frightening. The idea that my grandkids might not get the opportunity to snorkel with these herring really frightens me. At the same time, these fish embody hope because in spite of that 90% decline, they're still there. There are still thousands of fish that come up into our rivers below Conowingo Dam and spawn every spring, which gives me hope that, you know, these fish are going to make it if we just give them half a chance, but we have to give them half a chance. And there's other organisms in the rivers besides fish uh, that uh, face a lot of persecution, right? And this is this beautiful female water snake. And the only way I found her was because as I was hiking along Fishing Creek, the male hopped into the river and I heard the splash and looked down. Otherwise, we would have never seen her. And we, we stared at each other for a good, I don't know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. I crawled down on my belly and I got to within a foot of her, two feet of her. And she didn't even once flick her tongue, right? So the number of times that I come out of a river or come go into a river as people are hustling out because there's a water moccasin down there. 
Well, water moccasins don't occur here, right? We're too far north. And even if it was a water moccasin, so what? I've snorkeled with them too in Alabama and they never bothered me once. Now I didn't go after them, right? But they didn't chase me. These, these animals are just absolutely beautiful and stunning. I mean, look at the colors on this beautiful fish, or be a beautiful fish, beautiful snake. And they're incredibly adept and agile swimmers and, and top predators. And so I could rarely get a picture of these, these snakes underwater because they don't want anything to do with me. And I can never swim hard enough or fast enough to keep up with them. And so here's a female who is heading up into a waterfall. And I'm trying like, like crazy to get, to get a decent shot of her. And she just doesn't want anything to do with me. And they're just such agile um, hunters. I mean, just proficient at being a top predator in those in those river systems where I've seen a, a, a water snake haul out a catfish a good foot and a half long and try to eat it. Just really incredible. Now, if you grab them, they're going to grab you back, right? Just like any wild animal. But they don't come after you and chase you. And there's other organisms in these streams that, that have this, um, this wrong persona about them. And this is a sucker. This is actually a juvenile white sucker. And so, you know, when you think of the word sucker and what, that, what, that, what image that brings to mind, uh, it's not these beautiful fish, right? You know, you think of sucker and it's kind of oafish and stupid and lunky and um, maybe, um, you know, uh, lazy. Uh, these are the exact opposite of that. This is a northern hog sucker. And I've seen these fish in the swiftest parts of the rivers and streams in our region in, in current that I could barely hang on to. And these are hanging there perfectly fine. And if you look at how their head is constructed, Right? They've got this sloped head and they've got these really large pectoral fins, the fins in the front that act like wings. And that current hits that sloped head and it hits those big wing-like pectoral fins and it forces that fish to the bottom. And it's absolutely magnificent to watch these really brilliantly colored fish just navigate extremely hard current with ease. And they use that big sucker disc to grub up food off the bottom. And there's another sucker in our streams that are really common called white suckers. And these fish get to be pretty large, a foot and a half to two foot. Again, really neat colors in the spawning season. The, the leading edges of their pectoral fins and anal fins get this almost a white, almost an aqua blue color. Um, and they, they form huge schools in the wintertime um, in deeper water. And they're often associated with these beauties, brown trout. Now, brown trout aren't from here, right? They're from Europe. Uh, but I still love swimming with a brown trout. They're just incredibly beautiful fish. And this is, this is one of the places where I find brownies. This is Tuck One Glen uh, on the lower gorge, and it's in the middle of winter. Um, in fact, this was kind of sketchy getting there. So it's maybe a mile hike in to this point. And on this particular day, um, I had to use crampons to get there because we had an ice storm that glazed the trail to get down to this point. And right downstream of me behind this photo, the, the stream is completely iced over. And so I'm a little bit nervous about getting into this hole because I don't want to get swept downstream because if I get swept under the ice sheet, there's a good chance I'm not gonna be able to break through to get, to get out. But as soon as I put my head in the water, there's a brown trout. And there was a school of four or five of them in this hole that's about five feet deep, along with a whole bunch of white suckers. But our most beautiful fish, I think anyway, uh, is our native brook trout. And one of the huge successes, I think, of the Riverlands and the work of the Conservancy uh, is that we've got brown uh, uh, brookies in Riverland streams. And we're really worried about the future of brook trout. Um, they are the ultimate canary in the coal mine for water quality. They really depend on clean, clear, cold, pristine water. In fact, a recent study showed that when you only develop 4% of a watershed, the brook trout are negatively affected. They're that sensitive. A report came out about four years ago from the EPA that said that, uh, predicted uh, that brook trout would not exist east of the Mississippi in the next hundred years. And that's their native range. It's the only native trout that we have in the east, right? Rainbows are not native to here. In fact, we can make the argument that rainbow trout are invasive given the amount of damage that they do to the feeding uh, ecology of rivers and streams when they're introduced. Browns, again, aren't from here. They're from Europe. But brookies are the only native trout that we have. And a prediction from the EPA that they're, they're going to be gone within the next 100 years from their native range really makes me sad. But the fact that they're in our riverland streams, again, there's a hopeful piece to that. Just absolutely beautiful, stunning, and really amazing athletes. So you'll watch this little one right here in a riverland stream. This is a young one. And so in the process of doing a, a book that I recently wrote, I spent a lot of time trying to learn as much as I could about 
about brook trout and really drilling down on the on the projection that uh, you know brookies were going to go extinct in their native range. And I met a PhD student at Penn State uh, by the uh, a woman by the name of Shannon White, and her research found two things. Uh, one is that brook trout stress to heat at a much lower temperature than what we thought, almost 10 degrees colder than what we thought, which is scary. Because one of the reasons that's, that drives the EPA prediction of the elimination of brook trout from their native range is, is climate change, is warming stream water temperatures because of, of a warming planet. Um, but Shannon found something else that was really important. And Shannon's really optimistic that we're not going to lose brook trout from their native range because they move all throughout a river system. We typically don't think of brook trout as migratory fish because they don't leave a river and go to the ocean and then come back in or vice versa. But they move extensively. What Shannon found is they move extensively throughout the same river system. And so if we remove impediments to their migration, like poorly constructed culverts and gravel that washes in from, from poorly constructed gravel roads or from improper logging practices, these fish will find those cold water refuge areas in those smaller tributaries, in those first and second order streams, when it gets hot out. And then they can move back into the main stem of the bigger rivers uh, when, when the temperatures cool down in, in, the, in the fall. Um, and so again, it's an example of if we just give these fish a half a chance, they're gonna make it. And the fact that we have these in, in our riverland streams on, on Lancaster Conservancy protected streams and they're spawning, this juvenile um, brook trout I found in a, in a conservancy stream that was just hatched a month ago. And if that doesn't inspire hope, and I don't know what does. This is incredible find for me because these fish are on their way out potentially. And yet there they are on conservancy protected streams making the next generation. And there's other fish in these streams that are really common and I think sometimes considered to be throwaway maybe. Not like the brookies that are highly prized as, as, a, as a game fish and as a beautiful fish. This is a very, very common darter called the tessellated darter. It's a male. And this time of year, these males put on this beautiful bronze color with kind of maroon highlights on their fins. And this male right here is actually protecting his eggs. So those eggs were laid uh, on the roof of that, of, of that overhanging rock at a great expense of energy. Uh, it took a lot of work to get to that point, including some dog fights, right? These males don't play around to get the right to spawn in those places. And so these are two males that are locked on each other's fins. And I've watched them just kind of somersault down through the river uh, in the current. And before that, there's a whole other sequence of behaviors that lead up to this, this wrestling match. And so what you'll see here are three males that are competing for the space. So the females aren't necessarily attracted to the male. They're attracted to the house. And so right in the middle there, there's a female. When, the, when I pan back over to the right, you'll see her. Um, and she selected that spot as the best spot for her eggs to be. Uh, that's going to keep her eggs as protected as possible. So the males are fighting over that space where the female is. There's a male that just went into that space. There's the female that just stuck her head out. She's gluing her eggs to the roof of that rock, that rock overhang, and he's going to fertilize them. And then he's going to protect them, all right? So here's this male, and he's got his eggs glued to the underside of this rock, and you'll see him. He patrols a territory of about two to three feet in radius from his home, from his eggs. He sees me and he's making the choice, am I a friend or a foe and am I too big to take, take, take me on? But I don't think there is such a thing. I've seen these fish take on, on, on you know, two and a half foot, three foot shad. He's gonna come back in, you'll see him flip upside down and he's gonna wiggle. There's the wiggle. He's dusting off his eggs. Those eggs suffocate if they get covered in sediment. And so this male guards those eggs against predation and he guards those eggs against sedimentation until they hatch in about 20 days. And here's another darter that's, that's common. This is from the Conestoga River, right? So when people are driving over the, how many, how many people drive over the Conestoga River every day? And if they even look off the bridges that cross the Conestoga, do they even give a second thought about the potential beauty that might be hidden from that re, underneath that reflective plain or in that muddy water? This is a green-sided darter, a male. Um, and again, this time of year, they put on these amazing color shows, although uh, male green-sided stay fairly colored up throughout the year. And this is another one that's very, very special to the Riverlands region. This is a Chesapeake log perch found nowhere else in the world except here, right? We are extremely fortunate 
that we've got a concentration of Chesapeake log perch that live in riverland streams. Uh, they're found in, in some of the smaller Potomac drainages, but that's it. Upper Chesapeake Bay, Potomac drainage, Susquehanna River drainage. So they are considered globally rare, but locally abundant. The scary part of that is though, you know, and I know one of the streams that, that's in the Riverlands region that has just an incredible abundance of these fish. If something happens to that stream, let's say what happened in Donegal Creek happens there, where we had some kind of a spill. We think it might have been a herbicide spill that wiped out, completely wiped out all the fish from that creek. We just lost a significant part of the global population of these fish. And they're just incredible. They're these really brilliant tiger stripe fish. And one of the things that's so endearing about them is their pointed nose, right? And you see this pointed nose on this one that's a little bit white. It's because they use them to flip rocks looking for, for food. And that, that's one of the things that, in my mind anyway, makes them so endearing. So you'll see them probe around and under all these rocks. We'll let that run for a little while so you can see them do some flips. I mean, they're really intently looking. There goes one, right? And they're looking for these, benthic macroinvertebrates. And the Riverlands region has just this incredible display of, of benthic macros. You know, and that could be a whole presentation by itself. I mean, they're just amazing. These are, these are this, this right here is a juvenile or a, 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 a nymph of a stonefly. And so here's another one. Look at the coloration on that stonefly. And this is from Fishing Creek about two weeks ago. These will crawl out of the water, right, onto grass, and they'll emerge out the back of their exoskeleton and become a winged adult. And as that winged adult, their only purpose in life is to reproduce and make the next generation. And then we've got mayflies. We've got like this amelitid mayfly, which is a swimming kind of mayfly. And this is from Tuckwan Glen. And we've got these crawlers. Uh, this is from Fishing Creek. And these also live for, you know, a, a year or two in the water and emerge as an adult. Sometimes they're so thick, the Wrightsville Bridge has to get closed down and people all gripe about them, but they're, they're a sign of, of river health. Uh, and so it's just one of the, one of the beauties of being on, on the river uh, is being part of these, these huge insect emergences. And then we have caddisflies. And so you can see, hopefully you can see, this is pretty well camouflaged, but right where that rock kind of meets the twig uh, is the head of this caddisfly and they construct cases. There's you know, thousands of caddisfly species, and each one has a unique case-making pattern. And this one happens to use big twigs. Um, these are really cool. Look at the green on that caddisfly that's pretty fully extended out of its tube. And these are filter feeders. So you see how they hang their, have their forelegs up into the current, just kind of filtering whatever comes by, and they snag, and they bring, they bring in to eat. And this one's got this beautiful case made out of these, these crystalline pebbles. And and I got to wonder if, why did they pick the ones that are, you know, like, like opalescent? Is that some kind of an intentional thing or was it just random? Uh, either way, they produce these, these things of, of intense beauty and they transform into winged adults. And one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had in a river was when I watched this happen. You know, I knew caddisflies. Caddisflies are standard in, in, in river ecology. They're standard in, in figuring out the health of, of the river and, and water quality. And, you know, you read all the textbooks about the life cycle of, um, of a caddis fly and, you know, they, they emerge into the adult and then the adult lays eggs in the river, right? And that's it. It gets a sentence. Well, I'm snorkeling in this river and I see hundreds of these silver things walking down the face of this rock back into the river. And I had no idea what they were until I got in and got a close up. These are female caddis flies that are covered in, in, in thin hairs that trap air around their body, which allow them to respire as they're walking back into the river to lay their eggs. So think about the suicide mission that this is, how incredibly daring this is, right? If, a, if an insect could be daring, that they're walking right into a river, right into fish's mouths to lay their eggs, to give their babies the best chance that they possibly can to find the best spot where they're going to attach them to the rock. And they'll, they'll be there for, you know, about two weeks before they emerge as larvae and start the whole cycle over again. And so in the last 15 years, I've snorkeled all over the place and decided to put these stories together into this book. And one of the places I got to snorkel was in California. And I went there in the summer of their worst wildfire season ever. 
and I went to the Mendocino National Forest to, to look at the Mendocino Fire Complex. Um, and it was, you know, right after, the day after they, they finally contained all of the, uh, the Mendocino Fire. And I wanted to get into rivers in Mendocino to see what they were like after the fire, because wildfires also affect freshwater systems. Um, one of the things that happens in the result of a wildfire is it increases the chances of a flash flood uh, because there's less vegetation to absorb the rainfall. And a thunderstorm came up and the river that I was in, the Eel River, um, came up really, really fast. And luckily I saw the signs of a flash flood before I got into the river. And so uh, was really watching carefully that I didn't get flushed downstream. And so left there and then, and then returned down to, to, uh, to wine country. So staying along the Russian River in wine country. And the Russian River is, is significantly impacted by agriculture, right? So we have this romantic vision of vineyards and, and winemaking, and it's really cool. But the same problems with agricultural runoff that occur here with dairy production occur there with wine production. And so the Russian is pretty significantly impacted. And so when I got into the Russian River at this spot, I had a really significant revelation. And so I'm going to read a, a short excerpt from the book. I returned to wine country and landed at Sunset Beach on the Russian River. The same water quality warning signs were hammered into the gravel, which I ignored. Thick willow tangles lined the shore. Behind them, sequoia touched the sky, though these juveniles were dwarves compared to their giant grandfathers and grandmothers, who would still be standing if we hadn't taken them down. The Russian ponds here, backed up by a large gravel bar and shallow riffle. Fish dimpled the surface and sent concentric rings, rings out from where they nabbed an insect. I was encouraged by the feeding activity that maybe I might see some fish. I slipped into the river as quietly and stealthily as I could. Murky water and algae covered a featureless bottom. I crept toward the banks where the willow tangles dipped into the water, hoping that the structure would hold fish. However, a good current flowed through the willows, so I was cautious about getting hung on a strainer. I watched what I thought was a new kind of sunfish for me, nesting under the willows. They had a flat oval body shape and a small sunny, uh, flat oval body shape of a small sunny and were silver with black leopard spots. It looked like they were nesting in a submerged tangle of willow boughs, and I just watched as they darted through the branches with ease. I felt like I was disturbing the fish, so I slowly backed out of the willows, making sure not to let the current map me to one of the submerged branches. I was able to take a few marginal photos, good enough to make a positive identification. These cute little leper-spotted fish were tule perch, the only kind of freshwater surf perch. Their range is limited to central, central California. Because of its limited range, it is at risk, even if it isn't formally assessed as at risk. I never knew these fish existed. Even if I had known they existed, it is entirely different to know these fish underwater on their terms. How many other freshwater species will I never know before they are gone? There's a timelessness to all this, a feeling that I am among beings and processes that make my life nothing more than a small insignificant blip. And yet what I do directly impacts these timeless beings and processes. I either disrupt and kill or enhance and heal. That night, I had Dungeness crab cooked on an open fire beneath towering redwoods. I am so small and insignificant compared to these trees, yet I have the power to kill them. I'm so small and insignificant compared to the rivers I snorkel, yet I can kill them too. And so it comes down to this. This is a beautiful uh, candy darter from Virginia. So just a little bit to our south. Was just put on the endangered species list. How many people don't even know that fish exists? that kind of beauty exists in, in rivers and streams just to our south. This isn't a fish, and it's not even from North America. It's a lead beater's possum from Australia, critically endangered. If we can't get our act together to save these cute fuzzy bundles of cuteness, how are we gonna get our act together to save something that looks like this, which is a really beautiful fish? But it's a fish, it's not even a mammal. Or how are we gonna get our act together to save something like this? I think the hellbender is just as cute as the lead beater's possum, by the way. So the hellbender was just named Pennsylvania's amphibian, state amphibian, which is really cool. These are North America's largest salamander. They get to be about a foot and a half long. And they used to occur, I would bet, in riverland streams. I can't be for sure if they occurred in riverland streams, but I know they occurred in the lower Susquehanna. In fact, the last one was captured below Conowingo Dam in 1989. Their range is shrinking for the same reasons that we're worried about brook trout. They need really clear, cold, clean water. Their eggs die with just a little bit of covering of sedimentation. Uh, and so we're really worried about these, these salamanders. Now, there's hope with them, though, too. Um, there's some captive breeding programs that are seeing some success, some artificial habitats that people are putting in streams that are being used by the hellbender. So, again, there's hope there. But I'm really afraid that, you know, we're, we're going to lose these magnificent animals. 
And it comes down to these rivets. Every time I get on a plane, I look at the rivets around the door and the window frame. And I ask myself, how many of those rivets could be missing before I decide I'm not gonna get on that plane? Before I'm worried that that airframe is just too brittle, too fragile to stay in the air. Well, how many species can we lose from a biosphere before we wonder the same question? Because each one of those rivets represents a species, right? They all work together to keep our biosphere, our planet functioning, including things that look like this. This is another fish that we should have in Riverland streams, and I've never seen them in Riverland stream. I've seen them just south of there, though. These are another migrant. So this is a sea lamprey. They spend their lives out at sea. Uh, they're called, a lot of people call them parasitic, but they're actually predatory um, because they, they, uh, they latch onto the side of a fish and they will suck the body fluid out of the fish to, to the point of death. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they're, they're really maligned because it's kind of a, uh, a nasty way of making a living in a lot of people's minds. Um, and the other reason that they're maligned is because they're invasive in the Great Lakes and they're really destroying uh, the fishery there. But this is a male and he just hauled up into a stream that's just below Conowingo Dam. His nose is all white and battered because he just spent the last two days building a, a nest, a red, a big three foot bowl. And he was moving bowling ball size, 10 pound cobble out of the way by latching on with his sucker disc and rolling him out of the way. This is a juvenile, right? So that male will lay eggs into that nest and they will hatch and transform into things called amicetes. Uh, amicetes are, are actually filter feeders. So they don't have that sucker disc. They have an oral hood that filters water. And they live in our rivers and streams for six years as an amicete, as a filter feeding amicete. And so think about the ecological function and the ecological service they provide us in terms of clean water as filter feeders. Then they transform into this juvenile, uh, which will then head out to sea, live at sea for about six years, and then come back in as the adult to spawn. They spawn one time and they die in the, in the process of spawning. And again, they're native here. They're native along the East Coast. They should be in riverland streams. I've never seen one there. Hopefully they're there. I just don't catch them. They're kind of cryptic. Um, but if you do a Google search and you look at online resources, the only thing you find is about how invasive they are in the Great Lakes. And so there's a perception out there that they don't belong anywhere in North America, when in fact they do belong, belong here. Another kind of lamprey belongs here. So this is from, from Idaho. And this is Nez Perce territory. This is the South Fork of the Salmon River. And I came here intentionally to experience this place. A good friend of mine's name is Jeremy Monroe, and he's the director of Freshwaters Illustrated. That is an organization that just does unbelievably beautiful underwater vide videography and movie production. And Jeremy did a movie about Pacific lamprey, which are, which are critically endangered. Uh, and they're endangered for a couple of reasons. One is that we intentionally poisoned rivers in the West to get rid of them because we thought they were killing off the salmon. And we, we learned that that was a mistake. That was wrong science. And they're migratory. And so, you know, this is Columbia River drainage. And by the time the, the elvers or the, uh, the lamprey get to this point, they've got a breach, I think, about a dozen dams. Um, and so in 1970, uh, a Nez Perce elder by the name of Elmer Crow stood at this very spot. And he saw what he thought was the last eel. Nez Perce call lamprey eel. And lamprey are critically important in Nez Perce culture. One is they provide a, a food source when food is really, really scarce. And two is they're part of their ceremony. They consider them brothers that give their lives so that the Nez Perce can survive. And Elmer stood here and he saw this last, what he thought was the last lamprey swim over this, this gravel flat. And he asked the creator, why did you show me this last eel? And then it dawned on Elmer that it was up to him to do something. And I firmly believe that one of the reasons why we still have Pacific lamprey on this planet is because Elmer Crow single-handedly started a truck and transport program from the Bonneville Dam. So what the Nez Perce do now is they catch the, the, uh, the lamprey, the Pacific lamprey, below the first dam in the Columbia River, and they bring them up into Nez Perce territory, and they hold them over winter in, in a hatchery. And then they release the adults into their home territory, which is the Nez Perce home territory as well, so that they can spawn. And then the, the young, you know, they, they transform in amicetes, transform into juvenile, um, juvenile lamprey and head out to sea and then, and then live for six years and then come back in. I never got a chance to meet Elmer. I wanted to. Uh, the, the movie Lost Fish came out the year that Elmer died in 2013, tragically drowned uh, in the Salmon River. Um, but I got to meet his family. So in the process of doing that book, I went to Idaho to explore Pacific Lamprey and to meet Elmer's family. And what struck me about Elmer was, was his life philosophy. It really resonates with me. We are the circle. That's what life is all about. We take care of one another. So when we have someone in trouble, 
that's when the rest of us have to step in. And that's, you know, so critically important right now in COVID. Um, but what Elmer's talking about right here isn't just other humans. He's talking about all other beings. He's talking about all those pictures that we've just seen of lamprey and trout and darters and even stoneflies. We have to take care of each other. And when one of those is in trouble, that's when the rest of us have to step in. And that's exactly what the Conservancy does. They're standing in the breach. As Phil said, we live in one of the most rapidly developing parts of the state, maybe even the country. And the Conservancy is there to not only set land aside while we still have land to set aside, but also to store it and to take care of it and to restore it. And so whatever you can do to support the work of the Conservancy, please do. Whether that's financially, whether that's volunteering as, as a volunteer steward, uh, whatever, uh, because this mission is so critically important to take care of each other, not only us, but also all of the diversity that depends on those conservancy properties for their survival. So thank you so much for spending the last, what was it, 40 minutes maybe <laughs> with us. Um, really appreciate your, your, uh, your interest in this. Um, if you have any questions about uh, uh, what you saw tonight and don't get a chance to ask, the best way to get a hold of me is that email right at the bottom, Keith at freshwaterjourneys.com. If you're interested in trips, I'm hoping to start running trips with the Conservancy maybe this summer. We don't know yet. It really depends on, on how COVID plays out. We want to make sure that whatever we do, we're doing it safely. Uh, but that might be a way that we could connect actually in the water is through a Conservancy trip. Um, but that's the best way to get a hold of me. Thanks. Thank you uh, so much, Keith. Really appreciate um, that incredible um, presentation. The, the photos were just absolutely stunning. Um, I truly can't get over them. Um, everything from the hellbender to the, the, every, the darters were just incredible. Um, if anyone has any questions for Keith, um, please feel free to put them in the question and answer section below at the bottom of your screen um, if you have any questions for him. Uh, while we wait for any questions to pop up, I just want to let you um, know about some of our upcoming uh, nature hours that we will have um, coming up. Oops, sorry, here we go. Um, in two weeks, we will have the Lancaster Wildlife Project presented by Dan Ardia from Franklin and Marshall College. Um, it is a six year project that has explored the amazing wildlife that calls our preserves home um, and the ecology and how they, they function within our preserves. And then we have um, our July offerings for Nature Hour, um, which will be every other Wednesday from six to seven, starting with rebuilding biodiversity um, in your own backyard with Elise Jurgen from Waxwing EcoWorks, controlling the spotted lanternfly with Sally Gregory from Lancaster County Conservation District, and Nature's Medicine, Healing Yourself in the Earth with Native Plants um, by Megan Gonick from Generative Health. We're really looking forward to those presentations. Um, so heading back to our Q&A here, it looks like we do have um, a few questions, Keith. Um, we have one from Julie that says, the water in your shots is always so clear. Is that typical or do you have to get lucky? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. It certainly it depends on, um, uh, on rainfall. Uh, but one of the beauties of, of Conservancy Preserves is because they've got a good part of that watershed also protected. Um, you know, things should mud up after a rainfall. Um, but conservancy streams typically clear uh, relatively quickly. Um, and so, um, you know, when I'm looking for a place to go snorkeling, I look for the green spot on the map because that's got the most protected land and the least disturbed land, which means it's going to be the clearest water. Um, but I mean, there are summers, two summers ago, the wettest summer in rec on record since I think the Civil War, it was pretty rough finding places to go in the east. Um, and the other piece of this is if you're only snorkeling in three feet of water, you only need three feet of visibility, right? So it's not like in the ocean where you need, you know, 20 or 30 feet to make the dive worthwhile. Um, just a little bit of visibility and you can see plenty of stuff. Keith, where can uh, people find uh, a book you mentioned? Where can cool. they purchase yeah. that? So it's, it's available on Amazon or if folks would like an autographed copy, just send me an email and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, uh, get you one that way. 
Um, Kathy wants to know, um, what role does the female darter play after she lays the eggs on the, uh, eggs on the roof of the rock that you yeah, showed us? When the amazingly, um, in, in, in darter world, the females don't play a role after that. The males are the ones that are doing the juvenile care. Uh, now, other, other fish species, it's different. Sometimes there's actually parental care in snakeheads. Right now, snakeheads are an invasive species that are starting to emerge. They're not in riverland streams yet, but they're good. They're they're on their way. Um, but both the male and the female uh, protect the young uh, in the nest. In that in that in that case. Wow. Um, we have another question from Craig. He wants to know um, how did the species of fish that you said um, was considered invasive in the Great Lakes get there? That's if a great question. Through we think it's through canal construction, right? So their native range comes really close to the Great Lakes. Um, and uh, some of the canals that were constructed to link some of those waterways we think were, was the pathway that was used for the lamprey to get into the Great Lakes. Amazing. Um, and we have another question. What was the biggest threat to the Susquehanna watershed species, and, and what would you suggest to do to try to positively impact that? Wow, that, you know, that's a hard one. <laughs> It really depends on the species, but you know, typically the Susquehanna is facing some serious water quality issues right now that kind of spans all the species. And so that's runoff stuff. And that's stuff that we can do in our backyard. Um, it, um, it's stuff that Conservancy is doing in terms of, of greenscaping and controlling urban runoff. Um, agricultural runoff is a problem. Suburban runoff is a problem. Certainly not pointing fingers at agriculture because I'm a suburbanite and I produce more nitrogen per acre than the farms do. And so I have to take responsibility for the nitrogen that I, I produce. And, you know, nitrogen is one of those nutrients that gets into water and it makes algae grow to excess and then excess algae dies and it causes a, a, a low oxygen environment. Um, and so, um, you know, some of these upcoming uh, presentations, like, I, I, and I forget the exact title, so Kelly, maybe you can jump in there with me on that. But the, the one about, um, uh, it sounded like backyard habitat, right? My bet yes. is by converting lawn, to backyard habitat, you're really doing a lot to also reduce runoff uh, from your property. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the things that we can all do is control the runoff coming off of our property. Um, but then, you know, also get, get involved with your local municipality to encourage them to do the same kinds of things. And we need to do a better job of breaching these dams. You know, I, I, I am so on the fence about Conowingo Dam because I live near Conowingo and I recreate around Conowingo. And it provides a lot of rec recreational opportunity for me. Um, but at the same time, it definitely blocks migratory fish passage. And this year, uh, the, the fish lifts, the shad lifts, didn't open for a month because of COVID. And when they finally did, snakeheads used the lifts. So they got shut down after only three weeks, which meant only one shad this year got up and over Safe Harbor Dam, and that was it. Um, so that's not a really good prognosis for a shad. And that's one of the easiest fish species to get open, open over the dam. We're seeing elvers you know, uh, trying to migrate back up into the Susquehanna that can't. And we're seeing a decline in eel numbers from the Susquehanna because of the dams. And so we need to do a better job of that. Um, Keith, we have time for one last question. Um, we had a question about um, some of the plants and algae that you discover when you're snorkeling as well. Um, you know, what, what plants and algae do we have in the riverlands here in Lancaster um, County? You know, in the in actual in the in rivers themselves, not a lot actually. They're really a rocky bottom um, um, kind of um, morphology, with a lot of exposed bedrock. Now there's some some really cool river weed, uh, which is um, and I forget the scientific. I just wrote the scientific name of river weed down and I forgot it already. Um, that grows on some of those bedrock shelves and it's actually it's, it's a submerged plant. Uh, it's a native. It's 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 healthy. It's a good thing for the rivers. Um, and then in some spots, we'll find, you know, uh, Vallisneri americana, which is uh, uh, wild celery, which is another native kind of a, a aquatic vegetation. Um, we might find some, some non-natives, some hydrilla, which is a non-native, some Eurasian water milfoil. Um, and most of that, though, is in the main stem of the Susquehanna. In most of the rivers that flow through the Riverlands uh, preserves, uh, they're really fast flowing, they're really, really cold, they're well shaded. And so typically, the only vegetation that we're finding is that that rockweed that's that grows right on the bedrock. Well, thank you so much, Keith. We really appreciate you taking the time today for this presentation. Um, and sorry to anyone whose questions we didn't get to at this point. Um, I truly appreciate it. I want to hand it over to Fritz for one last thank you to everyone for coming today. Thank you, Kelly, for uh, facilitating this. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, and Keith, 
Um, I'll go back to the beginning of your presentation. Uh, it was a young student from Boston. You were in a stream in, in Vermont, and she asked the question, how can we conserve something when we don't know it's there? Uh, what, a, what a challenging question. And yet tonight you answered that in some way, shape, or form for all of us as it relates to our local streams. Chubs, shiners, black-nosed dace, mid-Atlantic river herring, female water snake, juvenile white sucker, brown trout, native brook trout, darter, Chesapeake log perch. There are three types of macroinvertebrates, stonefly, mayfly, and the caddisfly. You had the wonderful hellbender, which we're really excited about and look forward to celebrating as part of Water Week. Uh, and, and the list goes on. I might have missed a few, uh, but I go back to that question, that all-important question. Um, how can we conserve something when we don't even know it's there? And you've started to help answer that question. Um, and we will take that with us. Uh, it's an important one. We look forward to collaborating with you as we move forward. Uh, and just want to thank you so much for the great work you're doing in exploring our beautiful streams and rivers. And thanks for the opportunity to share in this. And again, thank you for all the work the Conservancy is doing to protect this stuff. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.